there are no ifs, buts, or maybes anymore. The threat of climate change is real, dangers are imminent, and the future is catastrophic. This is the message from the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it confirms what we already know and can see in the world around us. From wildfires because of extreme heat and moisture loss to devastating floods because of extreme rain events and tropical cyclones because of the changing temperatures between the sea and the land surfaces. The future quite simply is here and it should worry us enormously. Indeed, this report coming as it is from the normally conventional and conformist world of buttoned up scientists should scare us into action, but real and meaningful action. There are some key takeaways from the IPCC report that I would like to discuss. Number one, that the world could hit 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature rise as early as 2040, which means that the speed of rise of emissions and the consequent temperature increase has accelerated over these last few decades. So instead of this being about the future, we are talking about a change that could be as imminent as 2040. And 1.5 degree Celsius temperature rise, we have to understand is a guardrail. It's a safety net of what is relatively safe. And this, what IPCC is now saying, could be breached in the next two decades itself. Two, science can now attribute climate change to specific weird weather events. And this report is different because for the first time, scientists at IPCC have come together and are no longer coy about telling us that climate change is caused by human related activities, that is clear, but they are going a step further. They are able to attribute climate change to specific extreme weather events. So we know with greater certainty today of the role of climate change in say, the extreme heat event in Canada or the wildfires in Greece, which are happening today, or the floods in Germany. This is new and important. But third, the big takeaway from the report is that the world cannot bank on sinks to absorb our emissions. Let me explain what this means. IPCC is telling us that the relative efficiency of sinks and the sinks are the Earth's natural cleaning system. The oceans, the forests and the soils which absorb carbon dioxide, their ability will go down in the coming years as emissions continue to rise. And just understand the consequence of this. Currently, oceans and forests absorb some 50% of the emissions that we release in the atmosphere each year. And now what we are hearing is that their ability to absorb these emissions will actually go down as the pace of heating goes up. So what it's really the policy implication of this is that we cannot bank on the sinks to clean up the emissions in the future at the same rate. And this is important because the new googly in the world has been net zero. And the net zero plans of countries has been for instance, the US has said that it will become net zero by 2050 or China by 2060. And this means they will remain below what their terrestrial sinks or carbon capture technology will be able to soak up or clean up. Now, if we take on board what IPCC is saying, then the sinks have reached their tipping points and countries will have to work even harder to plant even more trees to be able to sequester the same amount of carbon dioxide. So I think we need to understand that the world has really run out of excuses. It has run out of time and space and it needs to act now. So if this report 
which it must be, is a wake-up call. We cannot lose time in prevarication or finding new excuses not to act, including the empty promise of net zero by 2050. It's time we get serious about meaningful action on the ground today. And as I said, technologies exist to disrupt the current fossil fuel driven industrial system. But we need to be disruptive in action. This is what today's call for action is all about. And the second part of this is that transformational action is needed. And the reason for this is that we need a drastic emission reduction of greenhouse gases. 45 to 50% reduction over 2010 levels by 2030. And we need to reach net zero by 2050. Just a decade away, we need to reduce by 50%. We need transformational action. And this itsy bitsy stuff for sweet nothings of some new cars which are going to be electric by 2030 or that we will stop coal but then we will move to natural gas which is also a fossil fuel is just not enough. This is the big message, transformational action, not incremental small steps. And that is really the mother of inconvenient truths if you would call it. The fact is that top contributors to climate change are a handful of countries. Let me name them for you. The US and China together add up to roughly half of the world's annual emissions. Two countries are half of the world's annual emissions. So I'm taking now what is called the carbon budget. What they emitted from 1870 to 2019, then the United States, the EU27, that is the grouping of countries of the European uh, Union, Russia, UK, Japan, and China add up to 60% of the carbon dioxide budget. So the inconvenient truth is inequity. Now, this is where we also need to discuss India. What must we do and why? Frankly, India would like to sit on the high table of polluters. And technically, India is the third highest annual polluter of CO2 in the world. Fourth, if you take EU27 as a group. But the scale of our contribution is so insignificant that it actually cannot be compared. Between 1870 to 2019, India's share of the global CO2 budget is some 3%. And if you look at it on an annual basis, while China emits some 10 gigatons of CO2 annually, US 5 gigatons of CO2, just think, India emits some 2.6 gigatons of CO2 annually. So 10, 5, and 2.6. So yes, India technically is the third highest polluter, but for the population, for the size, even forgetting all that, our contribution is minuscule. But, and even if you take India's business as usual scenario, and this is often said, but you will emit more in the future. If you put all that together and you say, fine, India will grow, what is our business as usual scenario to move ahead? Then, even then, in 2030, India will emit less than what the US emits today, or one third of what China will emit at 2030. So just think of the scale of the rest and India. Now, I'm not saying this to say that India must not act. And that message I want to give very clearly. In fact, it is in our best interest to take steps to combat climate change, both at speed and at scale. Firstly, we are victims of climate change. We are seeing the worst impacts of climate change hit our people from extreme rain, cloudbursts, floods, and temperature rise. So we must act. Secondly, we can act. 
because we have a tremendous opportunity to reinvent the way we do things. From the way we practice mobility in our cities, to the way we build our houses with thermal comfort, to the way we provide access to affordable energy to the poor in our country. So we can act. And for us, action on climate change comes out of self-interest, or what you could call co-benefits. If we reduce local air pollution by transforming the way we drive in our cities, we also cut back on greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a double gain. And it is in our interest to do it. And I must tell you frankly, that we are not walking the talk currently. India is not walking the talk on climate change action. Now, Indian government is sanguine, is, is, is right in saying that we are doing more than what other countries are doing in terms of the comparable action to reduce CO2 emissions. But the fact is we have no measurable targets to reduce emissions and this is why we are doing okay. So in this way, we cannot and must not boast of our climate change action. We can only say that we are doing as little as we need to do in terms of our responsibility or contribution to the CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. So yes, our actions are today matching our responsibility. But the fact is this demands very little from us. And in these climate risk times, when science has a tough and uncompromised message to us, this is just not good enough. And my final point is that global leadership is in fact at its worst point. We know that climate change demands effective global leadership. And the one thing that we know from our pathetic track record in delivering vaccines to all in the world is that global leadership is at its lowest point. At least I can say in my living lifetime, I have never seen leadership so low. Climate change is yet one more global crisis that needs a strong global response. We cannot win this without cooperation of all. And this needs climate justice for all. It needs cooperation as a basis for action. But just as the war we are losing to the virus and the variant, climate change is also a great leveler. Today, not only the poor are hit by extreme weather events, but also the rich. So we need to act and we need to act fast and together. Science has spoken. Now action must follow.